the natural world there is a constant, undeniable fight for survival, and the organisms which have the most suited for survival traits will be the ones to pass those traits to the next generation. And so the average characteristics of a population will change over time, and given a very long period of time, this can result in very dramatic changes. Natural selection may be a stabilizing force, but it is not a creative force. Anybody with half a brain can figure that out. If you worked in a factory that made cars, suppose you worked in quality control. Your job was to check the car when they got done building it, you know, kick the tires, slam the doors, and drive it around, see if it runs. If you caught every single mistake, they don't, by the way, <clears throat> but if you did, okay, how long would it take that quality control process to change the car to an airplane? You say, Hovind, quality control can't change it to something else. Oh, I know. Only design engineers can change it. And God's natural selection is a quality control that will never change it to a different animal. It'll just make sure you get a good animal, that's all. This is natural selection in a nutshell, and there is evidence for it all around nature. To give an example, some microbes have evolved resistance to certain antibiotics. Natural selection is also ever so evident in the observed speciation. For instance, the California salamanders, which became separated geographically and evolved to adapt to different environments. The salamanders on the forest region relied on camouflage, while the ones on the coast adapted to display a coloration of dangerously poisonous newts to keep predators away. And so these salamanders are now so different, they are on their way of becoming different species. Homologies refer to similar structures in different organisms, for instance the forelimb in tetrapods. This would make no sense unless you consider a common ancestor. And this is very evident with embryology. For instance, the presence of limbs in dolphin embryos, which are virtually identical with the arm and leg buds in human embryos, or the tail in human embryos. These features are normally observed in later development, but the fact is, embryos display traits characteristics in their ancestors. And again, this makes no sense except in an evolutionary context. Why do birds have genes for making teeth? Why do dolphins have genes for making legs? And since we're talking about this, why do we have a muscle to move a tail, just like monkeys do, if we don't have a tail? Anatavism is the reappearance of an ancestral feature that disappeared generations ago. For instance, chicken born with teeth. or hind legs in snakes. Or human babies born with a tail. But the fossil record grew significantly since then, and new fossils are found every day. We can now accurately date them and put them in very precise periods of time. Creationists love to throw around the very famous and overly debunked claim that there are no intermediate fossils, often naming them missing links. Well, such claim is ignorant on its own because every fossil is in fact a transitional form. What they mean is fossils that present clear features found in both the classes of animals, they are transitioning. 
This is Archaeopteryx, a very primitive bird which lived in the late Jurassic. Actually, it's the oldest bird known so far, and it shows clear transitional characteristics from dinosaurs to birds. In some of the fossils, we can actually see the presence of feathers, clear indication that this animal was a bird. But in addition to the feathers, there are also reptilian characteristics, including a long bony tail, clock fingers, and teeth, which none of the modern birds have. Ambulocetus is a transitional form from land mammals to whales, an animal that could swim but also walk. Its periotic bones are structured like those of whales. From the nose adaptation we can see that it could swallow underwater, and the teeth are very similar to those of whales. Ambulocetus may be on a slight sideline, and we think that mostly because it's very strange it has its eyes raised up on top of its head in a very strange way and it's unusually large for an early whale but mostly the eyes up on the top of the head seems like an unusual specialization maybe it's not on the main line and there are plenty plenty of other examples But what I want to stress again is that all fossils are transitional forms. And there are also many fossils of evolutionary intermediates of hominids, showing gradual change from Lucy 3 million years ago, to other species of Australopithecus, to Homo habilis, to Homo erectus, to archaic Homo sapiens, to modern Homo sapiens, which is us. The discovery of DNA in 1953 has demonstrated that heredity fits evolution perfectly. Now we know exactly how it works. While some of the traits are blended, many are not. Furthermore, along the way in the process of reproduction, DNA is subjected to mutations. Some of those mutations produce traits that are benign. Some of them are harmful. For instance, a shorter tail in a feline that needs a long tail for balance. But occasionally, some of the traits are beneficial to survival. For instance, a variation of spots in the coloration of a feline that provides a better camouflage, and those traits are passed on. Genetics explain how the new traits appear. Darwin did not know that, and he had no idea how they were passed on. And yet, with the discovery of DNA, his theory became stronger than ever. Even more so, genetics prove beyond doubt that we do share a common ancestor with the great apes. While the cells of all great apes contain 24 pairs of chromosomes, the human cells contain 23 pairs. So if we do have a common descent, we would find in our genome a fusion between a pair of primate chromosomes. On the end of every chromosome, you find genetic markers called telomeres. In the middle, there are different genetic markers called centromeres. But if a mutation caused a pair of chromosomes to fuse, we should find telomeres not only on the ends, but also in the middle of the chromosome. And not just one, but two centromeres. And that's what we find in our chromosome number 2. All the markers are there. It was formed by the fusion of two primate chromosomes. This is the nail in the coffin proving a common descent. We now know that the age of the Earth is about 4.5 billion years. and living things have been on Earth for about 3.8 billion years. With the discovery of genetics, we learned that heredity works exactly as needed to support his theory.
We learned that the Earth is old enough for natural selection to produce all the diversity of life seen today. And now we even have the technology to study natural selection as it happens. And in all this time, not one piece of evidence was found to contradict evolution. And still there are so many people who just won't accept it.